really think you need much of an introduction, but I do have one. Um, Dame Allison uh, was the first woman to front a cooking program on television in New Zealand um, in, back in the 60s. Uh, she's been a groundbreaker in the culinary world with an impressive career that spans about 50 years. Uh, she has written 99 cookbooks. <laughs> this, uh, this memoir is her 100th book, her century. Um, she successfully promoted uh, New Zealand beef and lamb overseas, and she's the face of one of our most recognized business brands. Please welcome Dame Alison Holson. I'd rather stand up because then you can see me better and I can see you and I can see if you're going to sit. <laughs> then I'll sit a bit more loudly. And it is lovely to be here. I was brought up in Dunedin and I really enjoyed it. I left when we were about, when I was about 25, 26 I guess, because Peter, I was married to my husband Peter, and his boss was moving to Wellington and wanted him to move there too. So I just said, sort of okay, you go. Uh, but both of our children were born in Dunedin and I was brought I was born in a little little private hospital called El Nido, which means the nest. <laughs> and it's down on the other side of the gardens. And it was a lovely place to live. A really lovely place to live. You know, you don't realise some of these things until you go away. But that's the way it was. And then we went to Wellington, and Wellington was a nice place to live to. Very windy, funnily enough, and lots of hills. But again, an interesting place to be in. And when Peter had retired, we just happened to be sort of cruising around, and we went up to Oriwa which is north of Auckland, and a little town on the beach. And we were in a motel, and we um, walked along the beach, and here were two places for sale. And he said, you know, this is a really nice place, isn't it? We could live here. <laughs> and it was very nice and warm, lovely beach. And I rang a travel agent, a land agent, and she said, well, you can't see the places till tomorrow, but there is a place over the road you could come and see that now. And I said, oh, she said, it's an apartment. And I said, oh, I couldn't live in an apartment. <coughs> he said, why don't you just come and see? And Peter said, well, I'll stay here. You go and see what it's like. So I did. And I opened the front door and it was like a dark little rabbit warren. And I thought, oh. And the man came out to meet me and said, just keep walking, keep walking. And I went into this place and I looked through and here were a whole sort of was windows all along like that on the outside. And looking out onto the Wangapura Peninsula and this lovely sea and various islands in the distance, and I thought, whoops, I could live in an apartment if it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And we've lived there ever since. The only thing I don't have, I don't like about it, is that it takes about an hour to get to the airport. And I do a lot of travelling backwards and forwards. Not nearly as much now as I used to, but I've, yeah, I've done things from Bluff to right up the top of the, of the North Island. And I've, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I did a home science degree, a Bachelor of Home Science degree, which was a four year course. I didn't want to. I wanted to be an architect or I wanted to do fine arts. And my mother and father said, no, you'd have to go to Christchurch for that and we can't afford it. <coughs> so somebody said to my father, tell her that if she did home science, there is some design in the course. And she'd like to. <laughs> it wasn't very much, I might have. <laughs> but anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed my four years there. And then I went off to, to Teachers College in Auckland. And that was a very useful thing to do. The only trouble was we didn't have um, someone in charge of us. I don't know. She was just a babysitter. She sat and listened <laughs> and talked to us. But when she wasn't doing that, the good thing about it was we all went off on section 
to four different places <coughs> in the course of that year. And I had a private girls' school to go to, and then I had a very large co-ed school at the edge of Auckland. Then I came back down here and I went to girls' high school, to a girls' high, and then King Edward Tech, which was a tough school in those days. And during that year, I got a letter from Miss Gray, who was head of the um, home site in the post of food department, saying, would you like to come back and teach in the food department? <coughs> I thought, wow, you know, have I done enough? And I thought about it and I thought, yes, well, I have actually done um, as much food as I should, as I could have done. So, yes, and I really enjoyed it. So, and Peter was still a student at the medical school, and I knew it was hard to get a job. So, at here, I had to come back to Dunedin, but it was very hard to get a teaching job. So, I said, yes, please. And I started very quickly and so I stopped as I left. And it was a very interesting thing for me because I had classes, a, a class where there would be um, there would be four people sort of sort of sitting around a, a square, and I suppose there were four of those for most classes. So that was say sixteen people, sixteen people in the class, and I had those people for three classes a week. So that's three by fifteen. And then you can multiply it by the number of weeks in the year when you are at the, at the school. So it turned out to be, I'm not going to work out the numbers, but it was a lot of, lot of classes. And for each class, and I think the first class I taught was an egg class. So I had to teach, I had to show everybody how to make an omelette, and then everybody went back to their bench and made an omelette and it up and I marked it. And then I gave everybody a card with a different address So there were 16 different recipes each day. So that's multiplied by the number of people, by the number of people per, you know, in, per week and then per year meant I got to know a huge number of recipes. And when you think about it, if you're just cooking at home, you don't really cook hundreds of different recipes each year, do you? You just sort of know what your family will eat and know what they like <laughs> and things like that. So I really enjoyed it. And in my second year, I think there, or third year, something like that, I it's hard to remember exactly, television started in New Zealand. And there was one channel. And I think it started at 6 o'clock at night, and I think it finished at either 10 or 11. And there was a little kiwi at the end, who said, what? Good night. <laughs> We're all well trained. <laughs> anyway, Graham Care was the person who cooked on those, those first programs. And we didn't have television, so we didn't see any, any of the things that was happening, were happening. But so many people throughout New Zealand complained, saying, he doesn't cook the sort of food that families eat. And as a result of that, so many people were complaining that the, whoever it was who was head of television came down to the home science school <coughs> and said to Miss Gray, do you have anybody who would be suitable to do everyday home cooking on television? And Miss Gray said, yes, her. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went to the Department of Home Science Extension, which is adult education, and those were evening classes. And those evening classes happened, I think, once or twice a week. <laughs> It was interesting because they stopped by on their way after work. And poor things, if I wasn't interested, they went to sleep. <laughs> so I learned how to be more interesting, to keep them awake. Anyway, the television man went to the, the Department of Home Science Extension too and said, do you know anybody who'd been suitable? And they said, yes, sir. <laughs> so I just got told to go down to the television studio and cook. And 
I don't think there had been a television studio in New Zealand in Dunedin, really. There might have been someone sort of standing up and talking, but certainly not anybody cooking or sort of moving around the kitchen doing things. And they said to me, you can't stop, because in those days you couldn't sort of just stop and do bits and that the way they do now. So, and I think that I had to make a program, I can't remember whether it was a quarter of an hour or half an hour, but it was quite a long time. And they said, you mustn't stop whatever you've got, you just keep going. And I managed, but it wasn't all that easy. I think one of the first things I made, and is it in, have you got that book? Here I am, standing there, in a red patterned viola dress. <laughs> well, I chose it because viola books are not showing spots. <laughs> and it's got a sort of pattern on it, but you know, not too much, not too busy. So I made this dress, and I think I was pregnant the first time. So I sort of put an elastic thing around it by side but open it and sort of put a belt on top of it. So they said it was all right. So here I was, I had this cord, put up the leg of my, you know, this was on the dress, so it wasn't up the leg of my pants, it was up un inside and pinned inside so you couldn't see it. And that was all very well, so I did. And then they said, right, cook, you know, do a trial more And I think the program that I made was a meatloaf. And meatloaves were not too usual in those days. A meatloaf was more of an American idea. And I made this meatloaf and I thought, right, I'll make a double quantity meatloaf and a long cake tin, a long loaf tin. And if I didn't have, if people didn't have a long loaf, they could use two small loaf tins. So I mixed up the mixture, and in one of them, or at one end of them, whatever it was, I tatted it in and sprayed the thing and patted it in, and that was it. And on the other one, I embedded several hard-boiled eggs and covered them up again and put the thing in the oven and cooked it and brought it out and tipped it out and showed them what the cooked one looked like and sliced it in case they didn't know how to slice me, though, you know, <laughs> have to do something to fill the time up. And the other one, I used one that I'd, the idea was to leave it till the next day and cut it, and that was the ones that were, had the hard-boiled eggs in it. So you got the slice of loaf with the hard-boiled egg and the slice of hard-boiled egg, and it looked really nice. And I said, right, the idea is you use the hot loaf the day you cooked it, and you leave the next one for the next day, and you can have it cold with salad. People thought that was a really nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they said, yeah, that's fine. You can cook, you know, come back. <laughs> come back next week and do a series of such and such and then a series of something else. And I did. It, um, it wasn't easy because I hadn't done it and I hadn't seen it. Didn't, hadn't watched Grave Care on television. We didn't, when I was doing it, and it started to be played because they were played straight away. And um, we had to go next door to the dairy, the men in the dairy had a um, television set in the back. So <laughs> we could go and watch the television set. And later when Kirsten was older and she came to watch these things too, she thought that everybody's mother was on the screen cooking what she was seeing me cook. It was one of those funny things you wouldn't ever think about if, if the child had that to set it. So I kept on doing it. And there were all sorts of interesting things. I found that it was easier later to do a top and trousers. And I decided, I'd asked Miss Gray if, she, if there was any help she could give me or any things I could do. And she said, go and look in the library. So I went and looked in the library and there was a book that had something to do with it. And the only useful thing that it said was, don't wear a patent apron. It's sort of it's busy and um, it doesn't look good. So I decided that I wouldn't wear an apron at all. And I wore things like this that didn't show the spots and worked. And I can remember some funny things that happened. There was 
in some things I had to sort of move, do a lot of moving between the oven at the back. So you could, and it had to be at the back so that you could open it and see what was in the oven. And various things that were happening. So they decided that they'd put a man under the bench. <laughs> and he could pull the cords backwards and forwards. <laughs> and so that as I moved around the kitchen, I wasn't sort of tripping up. And it was a very strange feeling. <laughs>
And Peter and I sat down and thought about it. And I said, how many pages does it have to have? And I still don't know how many pages this has, because they divided it into four sections. Each one had about 15 pages for the four different series that I'd done. But anyway, we did it. The photographer came and um, did the photographs. And uh, Kirsten, who by that stage was a three of them, was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> she would wait till the photographer would put something, would, you know, would set something up, and he would set up his camera and put his black thing over the top. So it was, I don't know what it does, the black thing, but anyway, he used it in those days. And Kirsten would come, and she'd see something, and she'd just pick it up, take a little bite. <laughs> and, that and there's a few recipes there, a few pictures where you'll see a little bite. Because <laughs> I didn't always see it at the right time. It was fun it's funny some of the things that happened. And then the second book that I did, it was called Meals for the Family. And there was a picture of us sitting around the table. Well, Peter, they wanted Peter to be there too. Peter said, that's medical ethics, I can't sit there, I can sit on the back to the camera, that's all right. So he had his, his, his hair cut just the day before, as men do sometimes. <laughs> it made him look very young, because it was all cropped up the top. And, Peter, and people said to me, oh, I didn't know you had a teenage. <laughs> Simon, but Simon was there at that time, and Simon was in the high chair, and Kirsten was sitting at the table, and Peter was back to me, and I was sort of smiling, facing the camera somewhere, I can't remember where I was. But it took him forever to do it, and Kirsten had her feet up on the table, and all sorts of things, and here was Peter sort of saying to him, he couldn't say anything because, you know, he couldn't see his face. But what really made me laugh was, out, and I'm tidying the kitchen because I knew this was happening in my kitchen. And I said, um, I'd put Kirsten, in fact, Kirsten, who has always um, been fond of animals, and she had found this little bird that was a bit sick and brought him in. And I said, okay, dear, well, we'll wrap him up and up, we'll keep him nice and warm, we'll wrap him up, and we'll put him in the bird cage, and we'll just hang him up, and maybe his mother will come to take him away. So we hung him up. But it was so busy getting ready for the television thing that I forgot about him. And if you look, they, they actually had to reprint the, um, the second book several times. And on one of them in particular, here's the birdcage out with some, you can see it out through the window with the dead bird <laughs> lying in a little lump on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling people about this on one of my early talks, and booksellers started ringing me up saying, I want, they're saying, there's a lady here who wants, who wants one of Alison's books, and she wants the one with the dead bird on it. <laughs>
I love your book. When we hadn't much money, it was the best book to use. I had a friend in New York who worked for a large publisher, and she sent me all the posh cookbooks. They're still in perfect order, not like yours. <laughs> it has no cover. It has burn and scorch marks up the side. When I was making plum jam, pages fell out. And I named them and put them in the envelope, into envelopes. The microwave chocolate cake recipe is so faint that you can hardly see the words. Because obviously you had it so often and just chopped it all over. Um, I just love your book. When I saw it on special at Paper Plus this week, I thought, I'll get myself a new one. I think it will only weigh half as much because it won't have any ingredients. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping me through some tough times and for making my kids very happy. You are much more than you will ever, ever know to a lot of people. <laughs> lovely having, lovely having me to just come like that. Very nice. <coughs> All sorts of things in this book. It's a nice book. This is the first time I've had a book with lovely shiny pages like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really enjoy it. And I just opened this one, a chapter called Four Legged and Feathered Friends. And here's a picture of Simon, who looks a bit different these days mm -hmm. when you see him on television. There's Kirsten, and there's Maggie Tate, who lives next door. And they're holding three birds. Now, Kirsten, when we moved from Dunedin to Wellington, Kirsten was very upset. She wrote a note saying, I'm going to run away. I'm running back to Dunedin. Mm -hmm. And Kirsten decided the best thing to do was to make a bird and animal proof backyard and let her have as many animals there as she wanted. And it was a very sensible thing to do. And the gates into the backyard only opened from the inside, so no one could open them and let animals escape. And she collected all these animals. Peter made a hen house, and that was nice. We had hens in it. And then he came home from hospital and said, one of the people I work with has got this lovely big angora rabbit, but it eats all the cords that go to our turkey kitchen. Could, could Kirsten have it? So we brought home Demelza. And Demelza was a lovely rabbit. And she lived in the hen house with the hens. It was a big hen house. And somebody gave Kirsten a guinea pig. So we added the guinea pig in there into the hen house with the <laughs> other animals. And Demelza would lie on the side and the guinea pig would lie cuddled up. And the hens would run around the wall, and nobody bothered each other. It was, it was really good. And then Kirsten decided it would be nice if we had two guinea pigs, because one guinea pig was lonely. Well, you know it that <laughs> <laughs> So we got two guinea pigs. And the guinea pigs moved out into a hutch that Peter made. He's good at making things. And then we read a nice article that said, it's a good idea for creatures like guinea pigs. If you... What's the stuff you put in the spout in that sort of green, checked, plasticky stuff that you put in the stop the netting. netting, netting, right, green netting. And they said, open the drawer of the guinea pig place, house, and put the green netting around with sort of pegs on it. First of all, to have them very close, and then put more wider and wider and wider so it's got a whole big space and then take it away altogether, and the guinea pigs will then know how to run around and come back to its house, and they all did. It was lovely. So we had two guinea pigs, and the two mother guinea pigs look, lived very happily together. Then Kirsten said, um, I'd like to just have a, another guinea pig come in for a day or two. <laughs> so the guinea pig didn't come in for a day or two, and mother guinea pig got bigger and bigger and bigger. And guinea pigs are not very long-legged creatures, if you know what guinea pigs are like. And she got so big, had such a big tummy, her little feet would hardly touch the ground. Aww. And wherever she went, Auntie Guinea Pig went with her. Father Guinea Pig had gone back to where he belonged. And one day, not long after, Mother Guinea Pig and Auntie Guinea Pig went into the cage. 
and mother guinea pig gave birth to two or three little ones. And we left them alone, they didn't come out for several days. And then they both came out together with the babies running around. And we had a ramp so they didn't have to jump up things. This is Peter's good carpentry here. And it was really lovely. Those guinea pigs ran to whichever mother was closer, and they both produced milk. Wow. But, you know, stunning things happen. It's, it was really interesting. And we were living in Karori, and at the end of Karori, and down the back into the Ohio Valley, was a lady who was a biologist, and she had a sort of mini farm. And I don't know how we met her in the first place, but she was a really nice woman. And she'd ring up and say, come and see whatever animal it was. Come and see that my dogs just had puppies, and they were beautiful puppies. And they were sort of kept in the kitchen with a, under the table with her husband, who was an architect, and sort of put this four pieces of wood tacked around. And he was mother dog with all these babies around her, beautiful. <clears throat> but they also had a donkey. And the donkey. I don't know where Father Donkey was, but anyway, Mother Donkey was there, and she got bigger and bigger and bigger until she gave birth to her baby, and she dropped it and walked away and would have nothing to do with it. I don't know whether you've ever had a baby donkey. I've <laughs> seen a baby donkey, but they are the most beautiful creatures. They're just lovely. They're so soft. They've got huge eyes, and huge eyelashes and lovely big soft ears. So she had to come into the little, I don't know whether it was he or she, it, came, it lived in the kitchen too with everybody else. And it was given a bottle of milk twice a day and she rings up and say, come on, it's, this is speeding time, so bring the children and come down. And we did. And the donkey was finish the bottle and stand there and go to sleep standing up and just fall over on its side. <laughs> so it was a busy kitchen with the dogs and the puppies and, and the donkey on the floor. Everybody managed. And I can remember this architect saying to Peter as, as we were there one day, would you like to come and see my shit-proof room? <laughs> Oh, 
Uh, lives in one of the buildings just near um, the Catherine Mance who done for the blind. And she said, you know, she saw. <laughs> <laughs> Walking around in a duck behind me, duck like that. I said, really? She was a really good broadcaster. 
but my goodness, she could be naughty. <laughs> she would, I, I'd go in once a week to talk, and she'd wait until uh, I was in the middle of, she'd ask me a question, mm -hmm. and I'd just start talking, and she'd go right out of the room. <laughs> and I never knew when she was going to come back. <laughs> and I just had to keep talking as if she was there. The whole, it's a very funny thing to do. <laughs> I wasn't giving recipes, I was sort of talking about things. And then she'd come back and say nothing about it and ask another question. <laughs> and the other thing she did that I'll never forget was that she, I was talking again, she'd ask me a question, so I started to answer it and she would write down under the bench. <laughs> And she came back with a paper towel that she'd sort of twisted to make a massage of her chin. <laughs> get making faces to me. And it's very, you don't roar with laughter and that's the brain and it's serious. But we just had a lovely, those were just two of the various things that happened. But she was, she, she was a very good broadcaster and we had a very good time together. She was doing some scholarship in New York when I was in New York. And she was somewhere in London when I was in London. So we had a good time doing all sorts of things during those times. And it's, it's nice to have a friend that you have over the years. So although we don't see each other you know, every week, we see each other quite often. She was fun, but there we are sitting in the lab in the, one of the studios and she answered, well we should have been drinking wine but someone must have given us the wine to drink because we wouldn't have otherwise. <laughs> uh, I haven't brought my, my quilt to show you but it was great fun what's making a quilt and when I was working, I was doing a lot of work for the meat board and not so much, most of my work for the fishing industry board was uh, in New Zealand but the meat board sent me all over the place. They sent me to Singapore, they sent me to Hong Kong, they sent me right across Canada several times, right across America several times, and I never quite knew what I was going to strike. And on one stage, when I was going up to Sault Ste. Marie, do you know where Sault Ste. Marie is? Sort of. <laughs> it's up north. Yes, it's, there's this big river that comes right down from St. Okay, that was it. Anyway, I got to New York and I had my heelless shoes on and it was quite nice weather. It was lovely weather in New Zealand and quite nice weather in New York. And then they put me on a plane to go up to Sault Ste. Marie. And I um, got that, got out and found the snow was about this deep. <laughs> and it was dark by that time too. So the public relations lady and I got in the car with the driver and off we went because we had about a three hour drive in the dark to get to this other place. And that was all very well until the car burst into flames. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't really what you need. So we all got out very quickly <laughs> and um, the driver went off to sit, look for help and we sort of stood by the side of the road in the snow with my heelless shoes and things like that. And I suddenly said to the girl, but the, all the meat is in the car and I've got to be cooking with it on television tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. And she said, well, I'm not going to get it. We can't do it. It'll just, it'll cook itself in there. <laughs> so I can't, I have to do it. So I opened it, took it up, and it wasn't all that heavy, and sat it on top of a sort of, hump of snow on the back of the road. So we sat it back to back on this little um, oh, little thing, waiting in the man. The policeman came by and said, whose car is this? <laughs> I'm sorry, but we don't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, eventually he came back and off we went to the place. And um, we were in some sort of hotel-y, motel -y thing. It was a, quite a big place. And I looked, I opened the chili bun and it was froze, everything in it was frozen solid and I knew I had to be cooking with it all on the next morning. And I thought, what will I do? And I sort of patted everything around. The only warm place in the room was the bathroom because 
in climates like that, it's nice to have heating under the floor. So the floor was quite nice, so I took all the meat out, the frozen meat, and arranged it all nicely in the bathroom. <laughs> Set my timer to get up at 5 o'clock, so I could get everything ready to get down to the studio, which wasn't far away. And woke up the next morning, and I opened the um, door to the bathroom, and it was a sea of blood. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to um, take off my nighty <laughs> because I didn't want everything blood covered. So I crawled around on the floor naked, <laughs> picking up the cord and putting it in the in the basin, and. I had to use all the towels to mop up all the blood and put it in the bath. So I had to, you know, cut the meat and all the various things I had to make because I was making about six things. I was supposed to just be making a couple of things. Oh, you're that woman from New Zealand. Good. Good. Well, we'll do two, two different series with you when you come tomorrow. So we did. And I looked out the window just as I was ready to go, and I've never forgotten it yet. Here was this great big river going down beside me, just as close as you are. <coughs> and down it floated this great big iceberg. <laughs> huge, huge, no, this tall, much taller than the roof. And I thought, where have I come to? What am I doing? Why aren't I just in New Zealand? <laughs> but the iceberg went on its happy way. I took all the things to the place and we did, the, the people there were delighted with what we did. <laughs> but it just, those were the sorts of things that happened. When I was going away, people would say to me, have a lovely holiday. <laughs> and it, it's not a holiday doing these things, but it was fun. So I have enjoyed doing those things. All right, I won't talk about other things. I, you can look at, the, look at the things about the quilt. If any of you have got any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Alison at all? Anyone need some cooking tips? <laughs> <laughs> Just one question about the bread. My daughter couldn't have come down and she was making one of the, the breads the other week. She said, Is, are the recipes in pan bake or bake? I usually use bake because I'm always a bit worried that fan bake will make a crust sooner than I want it to. And for bread, it's got to rise before the crust is made. But I think it doesn't matter too much. And I think it's, you know, it might be nice to try the same recipe, tell your daughter, it might be time to, nice to, take, make, to make the same recipe twice and just see what works best. But I would, if it was me, I'd just do not fan bake. Yes. Did Kirsten become a vet? <laughs> <laughs> no. She's a geriatrician. She says she'll look after me in my old age. <laughs> She's sort of nice. And I work with Simon and we write our books together, which is a really nice thing too. And we did that first. When he had just got married, or he was just about to get married, and his wife decided she was vegetarian. So... <laughs> Simon said, would you write a vegetarian cookbook? And I said, well, I don't know all that much about vegetarian cookbooks. And he kept asking, and I said, all right, well, we'll do it. If you do it with me, we'll do it together. So when my, my mother-in-law was staying with us, and Kirsten, who had a baby by that time, was staying with us, and Peter was there, and Simon and I were there, and Sam... I can't remember where she was at that time, perhaps she was still down in Christchurch. <coughs> but we make all these things and put them on the table. And the things that got eaten got into the book. <laughs> <laughs> the things that didn't get eaten didn't get into the book. And that Meals Without Meat has been a, a really popular book. And it's, you know, it's quite difficult to do food for vegetarians if you're not used to it. So I think a lot of people have found it helpful which is nice. Have you updated that book at all? Because I bought that one. My husband's a vegetarian. Yes. Ah. But he eats a lot of raw food. Yes. Well, I think we're working on something bigger and better. 
<laughs> in, the, in, the, in the relatively near future. Uh, I, I think that book, Meals uh, Without Meat, has been, was in print for 20 years. Yes, that's yeah. 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 It was sold a phenomenal number. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the figure now, but there is another one in the pipeline. Yeah. Altogether, we have, what, 4.4 4. 4 million books. It's not books. Mm -hmm. And the duty books. Three months I didn't cook. Can I ask you, does your husband cook? Yes, he's just started. <laughs> and like, well, you know, his, his hours at hospital were just terrible. You never want anybody to be cooking there. There's a picture of him lying on the couch with one of the children sitting on top of him. I think he's fast asleep. <laughs> um, but in the last couple of years, he's got much more interested, but he doesn't usually use my recipes. He likes to use his own recipes. Isn't that fine? <laughs> yeah, listen, uh, at one time, with the interviews with Sharon Crosby, um, you were telling the tale of, of some um, event in London where the roast went on the, the floor. If it, it, it's something specific, you can remember. Quite part, I can't remember the details of it, but it's, it just seems so hilarious that it's something that it's something you can share again. Well, sometimes you have to decide, do you run, do you run it under the hot tap? <laughs> which I think is probably the most sensible thing to do. It doesn't really pay to cut off all of the bits around the edges because that's all the nice brown bits that you know. <laughs> But sometimes there's accidents sort of happen. And Sharon, let me tell you, would stand and say, Alison's coming in today, she's going to show us how to make K-pop um, cakes. Or <laughs> ridiculous things. And people didn't know whether she was really meaning them or not. <laughs> so she could say anything. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes? Obviously, over the years, cooking shows have changed. Um, how do you feel about the Master Chef and Jamie Oliver? I think Jamie Oliver does a good job. I have no time for people who yell at other people and tell them they haven't done things properly. I think that is a humiliating thing to do. And I would never have anything to do with people like that. Yes, he's very rude. Yes, Chef. Yes, yes. But I have to say, I did once meet him, and he could not have been more charming. <laughs> but I think his, the way he treats people is shocking. Yeah, that could s spoil someone's wanting to be a chef for the rest of their life, somebody yelling at them like that on television. I don't think they should put things like that on. Do you watch the MasterChef shows? No. <laughs> well, sometimes I do. I, I get tired. We get up at 5 o'clock every morning. And sometimes by the end of the evening, if it's not good, I go to sleep on the couch. <laughs> Anymore, but I, I like watching cooking programs. I like, I like watching Danny Oliver sometimes, but I like watching other things too. Uh, probably a bit. And hopefully with Simon. Um, but he's, they're just going to move, move the thing from Avalon up to up to Auckland, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's quite make things different. But we, we tend to do things together. I mean, if there's a new book out or something like that, we often do some new speech from that on the television. Mm -hmm. I have much more confidence now than I did those days, <laughs> all those, that time ago. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Oh, I don't think we've gone time. Many years ago in Wellington, when I came back from a holiday, we discovered fruits of one of the And I thought, one of those things is that I'll bring those Which I did. You know, and, then, and you said to me, Have you got a frozen chicken in there? And, and I said, Yes. And you said, What's it like? And I described it. And you said, Okay, chuck away that, chuck away that, eat that now, and keep that. <laughs> I do get a lot of people asking me questions, but I um, I don't have my address and telephone number. Uh, I spend all day um, answering people's questions, and I feel really sorry for people when things like that go wrong. I know what it's like. <laughs> Do you, have you made something to be friendly? 
many, many times. So many, many times have we eaten it afterwards. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard work. We have most of the work that's done now, most of our photography is done by um, Linda Keats, who's in Wellington, and worked with Simon. And he and Simon, the, last, the latest book they've just done, is, well, he's just done, and it's just been photographed, is gluten-free cooking. And the recipes in it look wonderful. I want to pick each one off the, you know, off the, off the page and eat it. It's beautiful, really lovely. It's just coming out now. So it's, 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 it's nice making it. You, it does take a lot of fiddle, and it depends on the lighting, and it depends on the cameraman, and you know, all sorts of things. And I don't like brushing things over with something that's not edible to make it shine and things like that, because I want to eat it afterwards. <laughs> so the way things are in our books, you know, they're, they're all edible afterwards. <laughs> Yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> Inside that, holding it up. 
I just I might be a bit soft. It shrinks. So I left the pastry hanging over the edge. Oh, that's all right. It's not a bit pleasant. Put some icing sugar over. Sugar for real savour. Dusting over the top, put a flower on top. Something. Or just take their eyes away from what's on the outside. Or the glass of wine, maybe. We probably have time for one more question. There's a woman down there still waiting.